Good morning from Dublin, and welcome to your Sunday service. I'm really glad that you're able to join us today. Now, let us begin with the reading of the Creed of the Church of Scientology. Before I start, I'd like to go over a word with you. That word is inalienable. Something that is inalienable is something that is yours, and it cannot be taken away from you or given away by you. It will always be yours. The Creed of the Church of Scientology. We of the church believe that all men of whatever race, color, or creed were created with equal rights. That all men have inalienable rights to their own religious practices and their performance. That all men have inalienable rights to their own lives. That all men have inalienable rights to their sanity. That all men have inalienable rights to their own defense. That all men have inalienable rights to conceive, choose, assist, or support their own organizations, churches, and governments. That all men have inalienable rights to think freely, to talk freely, to write freely their own opinions, and to counter or utter or write upon the opinions of others. That all men have inalienable rights to the creation of their own kind, that the souls of men have the rights of men, that the study of the mind and the healing of mentally caused ills should not be alienated from religion or condoned in non-religious fields, and that no agency less than God has the power to suspend or set aside these rights, overtly or covertly. And we of the church believe that man is basically good, that he is seeking to survive, that his survival depends upon himself and upon his fellows in his attainment of brotherhood with the universe. And we of the church believe that the laws of God forbid man to destroy his own kind, to destroy the sanity of another, to destroy or enslave another soul, to destroy or reduce the survival of one's companions or one's group. And we of the church believe that the spirit can be saved and that the spirit alone may save or heal the body. Now these are the beliefs in which we stand firm on. Now, there's a lot of information that goes around on a daily basis. You have the news, you have coffee shops, conversations with friends, the radio, and also newspapers. But what happens when you see something that's not true because you know that it's not true? Well, let's have a look at what L. Ron Hubbard says about personal integrity. What is true for you is what you have observed yourself. And when you lose that, you have lost everything. What is personal integrity? Personal integrity is knowing what you know. What you know is what you know. And to have the courage to know and say what you have observed, and that is integrity and there is no other integrity. Now you can think of a time where someone may have said something that was not true and you stood firm on what it is that you observed and you spoke out against it. That was you sticking with your personal integrity. Now you also may find times where you may have been silent or not spoke out against something that you saw or heard that was not true. It happened, okay. Now you see what personal integrity is. Of course we can talk about honor, truth, all these things, these esoteric terms. But I think they'd all be covered very well if what we really observed was what we observed. That we took care to observe what we're observing and that we always observed to observe. So you keeping a state of mind of where you are actually causatively observing something. You know that you're observing it. You're making sure that you're not taking in any bias, any data from some other source. You're looking directly at that thing for what it is and not on some via from some other place. And not necessarily maintaining a skeptical attitude, a critical attitude, or an open mind, but certainly maintaining sufficient personal integrity and sufficient personal belief and confidence in self and courage that we can observe what we observe and say what we have observed. Nothing in Dianetics and Scientology is true for you unless you have observed it 
and it is true according to your observation. That is all. What is the power of thought? Now, as we start this new year off, a lot of people are going to be making decisions. A lot of New Year's resolutions are going to be made. We want to start things that are going to take us through until the end of the year and accomplish very specific goals. With that being said, I'm going to talk to you today about the power of thought with consideration and mechanics. Considerations tank rake over the mechanics of space, energy, and time. By this, it is meant that an idea or opinion is fundamentally superior to space, energy, and time, or organizations of form, which are mechanical. Now, when I say organizations of form, take anything that is made of space, energy, and time, these are organizations of form, which is everything that you see, okay? Since it is conceived that space, energy, and time are themselves broadly agreed upon considerations, that so many minds agree brings about reality in the form of space, energy, and time. These mechanics, then, of space, energy, and time are the product of agreed-upon considerations, mutually held by life. This aspect of existence, when viewed from the level of man, however, is a reverse of the greater truth above. For man works on the secondary opinion that mechanics are real, and that his own personal considerations are less important than space, energy, and time. This is an inversion, a switch. These mechanics of space, energy, and time, the forms, objects, and combinations thereof, have taken such precedence in man that they have become more important than considerations as such. And so his ability is overpowered, and he is unable to act freely in the framework of mechanics. Man, therefore, has an inverted view. Whereas considerations such as those he daily makes are the actual source of space, energy, time, and forms, man is operating so as not to alter his basic considerations. He therefore invalidates himself by supposing another determinism of space, energy, time, and form, although he is part of that which created these. He gives them such strength and validity that his own considerations thereafter must fall subordinate to space, energy, time, and form, and so he cannot alter the universe in which he dwells. So, what does that mean? When you say, I'm going to lose weight this year, and then you start taking steps, and then you say, oh, well, I have too much things to do. I have to do this for work. I have to get the kids ready for school. I have to do this. I have to do this. I have to do this. All of these things are mechanic things. You're allowing for the things that make up mechanics take over the consideration that you've made about your losing weight. Now, I just say that because of the fact that that's normally something most people do at the beginning of the year. I'm not talking about you. You're perfect the way you are. The freedom of an individual depends upon the individual's freedom to alter his considerations of space, energy, time, and form of life and his roles in it. If he cannot change his mind about these things, he is then fixed and enslaved amidst barriers, such as those of the physical universe and barriers of his own creation. Man thus is seen to be enslaved by barriers of his own creation. He creates these barriers himself, or by agreeing with the things which hold these barriers to be actual. So, for instance, I want to start my own company I want to get this going. I really want to get this going. Oh, but it costs too much to get the company started. I don't have enough people working for me to get a company started. So many things we create out of our, out of our own ideas. These are not barriers that actually show themselves to us. They pop up in our mind, and then we put the barriers there before we even come into the contact with the barrier. No, just get started. You have the consideration. 
Get started on it. When the barrier comes up, you'll handle it. All right? There is a basic series of assumptions in Scientology processing. Another word for auditing. A special form of spiritual counseling unique to Scientology, which helps an individual look at his own existence and improves his ability to confront what he is and where he is. The first of the, these is that man can have a greater freedom. The second is that so long as he remains relatively sane, he desires a greater freedom. And the third assumption is that the Scientology practitioner desires to deliver a greater freedom to that person with whom he is working. If these assumptions are not agreed upon and are not used, then processing degenerates into the observation of effect, which is, of course, a goalless, soulless pursuit, and is indeed a pursuit which has degraded what is called modern science. So what would be an observation of effect? Oh, well, I can't do this because blah. I can't do this because blah. I can't do this because blah. This isn't happening because of blah. You're only observing the effects and not the cause. And that's what you are, a causative being. The goal of Scientology processing is to bring an individual into such thorough communication with the physical universe that he can regain the power and ability of his own considerations. A Scientologist is one who understands life. His technical skill is devoted to the resolution of the problems of life. With Scientology processing, you can achieve greater personal awareness. And with that increased awareness, you will be able to better handle life and achieve real happiness and success. Begin your processing and take your next step. There is a bridge to a greater freedom. All you have to do is take that step. And now we'll be ending Sunday service with the reading of the Scientology Prayer for Total Freedom. May the author of the universe enable all men to reach an understanding of their spiritual nature. May awareness and understanding of life expand so that all may come to know the author of the universe. And may others also reach this understanding which brings total freedom. At this time, we think of those whose liberty is threatened, of those who have suffered imprisonment for their beliefs, of those who are enslaved or martyred, and for all those who are brutalized, trapped, or attacked. We pray that human rights will be preserved so that all people may believe and worship freely, so that freedom will once again be seen in our land. Freedom from war and poverty and want. Freedom to be, freedom to do, and freedom to have. Freedom to use and understand man's potential, a potential that is God-given and God-like. And freedom to achieve that understanding and awareness that is total freedom. May God let it be so. Thank you for coming and joining us for this Sunday service. I look forward to seeing you next week.